I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. Hi guys. I mean, really, no fear. I'd like to say welcome to all the new subscribers to the channel. I hope you're finding what you're looking for here and that you'll continue to resonate with some of the content that I create here. If you're new here, my name is May and I like to talk about all things holistic decolonization, womanism, liberty, sovereignty. Those are the things I love to explore. And today I wanted to share a video that is more of a reflection of my own growth over the last 10 years. Um, especially when it comes to me leaving religion and basically being a godless African. I have written down a bit of a script because I don't want it to go everywhere. So if I'm sometimes looking somewhere else, that's what's going on. I try to be as slick with it as I can. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy this video and that it gives you also some reflections and insights. So the last few weeks and months, I've been facing the many and very ironic ways that I'm not African enough. Oh, as the popular insult goes, a Western deluded African. This is sometimes a fear that many African parents have when they raise their kids away from the continent as well. Hi guys, this is Editing May. I just wanted to say that the audio gets really muffled at some point. There was something interfering with the mic, but please do bear with me. It's not through the entire video, but just some areas. Thank you, bye. The irony is that I made this entire channel talking about decolonization and just exploring the many ways to connect to our Africanism. But the more I grow as a person, the more I recognize that in so many ways I do so many things that can be labeled un-African. And this channel for me has been an exploration of a holistic and personal decolonization journey. And those are the things I love to share here. Basically how to feel and live a more holistically liberated African life. Um, and that includes mind, body and soul and also the purpose of life. That's what I've been dedicating the past few years of my life to and also things I explore on this channel as well, as well as my other channel, which is more focused on the holistic living aspect of it. So I have changed a lot in the pursuit of living a life that feels very authentic to me, whether that has been giving up me, whether that's me not being afraid to love somebody of the same gender or becoming a womanist and opting out of all the ways that patriarchy is involved in my African upbringing, even under the guise of sacred tradition and cultural norms. The biggest one, however, that I would have never imagined doing was leaving religion. The other day as I realized that I had made it to almost a decade as a vegan, I remembered that another milestone was also close by. It had been 10 years since the day that I closed my computer after three weeks of obsessive research on all the topics I had never been able to explore as a Christian for 23 years. The irony is not lost in me that the reason I even started that obsessive research was to find ways to be closer to my religion and be more firm in what I believed in and be able to better defend it. I remember the key word that I had for myself or the key sentence was, if something is the truth, it cannot fear being questioned even by outside sources because this was not something I always did as a Christian. We always read things that were kind of approved um, to support our Christian experiences or our religion. So I was like, let me open it up to everything and then see if it's the truth, it will remain the truth for me regardless, right? That's how I started my research. Of course, there's no spoiler alert how that ended, <laughs> but that was my intention when I started that journey 10 years ago. When I closed my computer, I knew that my life would never be the same. And honestly, it was more dooming than exciting to begin with. I also had a lot of questions about what life would be as a godless person. Who was I going to be without this book that for 23 years had given me the beginning, the middle and the end of my life? It was a very scary beginning of a big new journey for me. But whatever was on the other side, I also knew that I had to face it because there was no turning back. I couldn't unlearn or unsee or unconnect to within myself what I had discovered. And the phrase that kind of helped me to continue and be like, you know what, it's okay. 
we're going forward. And if by some way, by our continuous openness and eager to learn, eager to be okay with being wrong, if that's the case, if in years down the road, it leads me back to religion, then that's also okay with me. Because the whole idea was not just to take things at face value, but actually make sure that I was choosing to live according to things that made sense to me. So that's how I opened up this new adventure and made it less scary. I'm like, we're just going to continue going forward. And if things lead us back to God, then that's where they lead us back to God. I also knew that I was not an atheist from the beginning. There was no doubt. Even though that a lot of the things that helped me understand and maybe even led me to leave my Bible were from scholars that maybe would classify themselves as atheists, I knew that that wasn't who I was because I could feel within myself, I've experienced enough things to know that I don't believe there is nothing. So I see myself closer to agnostic, but more from a place of a nomadic spiritual person. I don't focus too much on the gods or the non-gods. I focus a lot on being present with my life, living in a way that feels connected and meaningful to the things that actually do make sense to me as an individual. It's a very, very individual journey and approach. I also wondered how I would find this connection to what we see as God, or even as I say, like there is something bigger than us, perhaps a consciousness. How would I find and connect it if there were no missionaries that ever crossed my land, if there was no Bible that ever landed in my communities? How would I see God and how would I connect to God if I believed that it was something that was already within me, what would that look like? To know that whatever created me already gave me everything I needed within me to connect to it or them. So growing up in a society where religion is deeply ingrained in our culture and daily life, my decision to step away from faith was not easy. For what is an African that belongs to no God? Not even the old ones and not the new ones either. We've always belonged to some God to some degree. So over the past 10 years, I've had to explore all these shifts in identity, in culture, in my Africanness. Being a person who's not led by a God or who does not factor in religiousness in the things I do. I still, of course, don't live in a world where I can take that for granted because the people around me, the way my culture is informed, the way we practice so many things are laced with religiosity to some regard. So when I say I live a godless life, I also am quite aware that in so many ways, the ways that shape my world, the way that shapes even the laws we have, the ways that shape the cultures that we have and we lean back to in tradition. I spoke about that also in my previous video on the hypocrisy um, for homophobia in African cultures, because a lot of it also is rooted in our Christian influences or our Muslim influences. And all these things were not naturally a part of our culture they came with the people that came with them right even though like i know there's also people who argue oh but christianity actually had its roots in ethiopia like there was yeah but the way that we got it it wasn't ethiopians coming down it wasn't people from the the first bible <laughs> coming down to give it to us it was through other forms of invasions and colonization in line with those things that we got it so it influences a lot of the way we see ourselves the way we see the world and our cultures and our norms and our traditions so in this video i would just like to share some of the shifts that i have had to face and adapt to over the last decade as an african trying to navigate the world but also questioning the influences of the lenses of religion that I grew up with. The first thing I needed to figure out was myself and the place I held in the cosmos. Who am I with no God and no devil guiding my every decision? I never knew who the person in between these two was. The one that was constantly battling either inching closer to God or to the devil. I remember always feeling like all the good things I did belong to God and all the bad things I did belong to the devil or were because of the devil. But what belonged to me? Who was I without these two? I felt like Bella in the movie Twilight, always having to choose between Edward, the self-righteous vampire, or Jacob, the principal beast. But what if Bella wanted nothing to do with them and their century-old 
ego was? What if she had no desire to be a pawn in that divine game? If she merely wanted to live her mortal life as it was right now, right here. This has been one of my favorite explorations in my godless adventure. Getting to know myself and taking full responsibilities of my own hells and my own heavens. Knowing that I can't live a passive life in God's and the devil's waiting room before I could finally be rewarded with a heaven where I could actually start living my real life, right? I remember when I was baptized at 12, I almost didn't want to clean myself because I wanted that feeling to be on me forever, that rebirth, renewal. And then 11 years later, when I closed my computer, that was another form of rebirth, but it wasn't a renewal that committed me to a God, but committed me to myself and to life fully. And that's how I saw that moment, that significant moment in my life. It was a commitment to life, to myself, to figuring things out. No roadmaps, no dogma, no shelter, and no predetermined reasons why everything was or would be. It was a blank canvas, a new book, and I got to paint and write it as I lived life, as I engaged with life. One step and one choice at a time. It was open, wild, and fully mind to co-create an experience. I think also as an African on a personal decolonization journey, this venture has also let me explore and expand what it means to be an African. Because I think growing up, we couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine being an African without a God, as I said previously. But being able not to exist for future generation in some way and know that to be African is not just you choosing to be a Muslim or a Christian or maybe an animist. You can also choose your own path. You can also create your own path. It's another form of expanding the way that we can be liberated to choose, to be individuals, to have individual experiences and to trust our own authority over our own lives. I think when it comes to liberty, that is a very important part of it. Your ability to trust yourself, your ability to know yourself, your ability to be able to self-actualize, right? It's a freedom that is not afforded to many. So by choosing to stand and be seen and counted as a godless African, it's also me adding to other fellow Africans and knowing that we can exist in so many ways. Not that one way is better or more right, but we can exist in so many ways. And I think that's something that's often lost when people are oppressed or put in stereotypes or put in small boxes. Their space to roam freely is also minimized. It's the same thing when we have gender roles or when we have race stereotypes, right? And what is a black person, what's an Asian person? There's this need to limit and put people in fine-tuned boxes. And by existing and daring to jump out of those boxes and expand <laughs> what it means to be a certain kind of African, you also give more breathing room for everybody else to choose or question and wonder, is this who I am and want to be? Or is it just the only option I've, I've ever received? to choose from, right? So I find that also very exciting from an identity perspective, but also from a community perspective and a black conscience perspective. So family, community, and culture. I think, like I said before, growing up, I remember even my mom saying that people never really cared what religion you belong to or what God you belong to, as long as you belong to a God. And I think part of it is also because in so many ways, anything that does not belong to God, whether that be a Jew, a Muslim, a Jehovah Witness, a Mormon, <laughs> am I forgetting someone, the main ones, a Catholic, um, all the big ones, all the big guys, all the uh, legitimized religions, right? When you belong to that, people see that you belong to the light, maybe a different kind of light. But to not belong to that, in so many African ways, we see that as darkness. It's everything that does not connect to those Abrahamic faiths in some way is backward, it's primitive, it's darkness, right? And I think in a way also in my own liberation journey, this has been 
something that I have gotten the privilege of questioning that, like, why is it? Obviously, we know that when missionaries came, when colonizers came, they deemed everything that Africans were and everything that Africans did as savage, as backward. And in order for them to be civilized, to be with the lie, to be of the right nature, fully human, they had to turn their backs on everything that was deemed belonging to the darkness, a devil worship and what have you. I remember even my mom telling me that in her upbringing, even dancing was seen as something devilish, whereas dance is a very important thing of our African heritage. Likely I didn't grow up in the same strict way of seeing religion when I grew up with my mom, but it pained my heart to know that something that was so natural to us as Africans, to dance, to play drums, to all of these things that were seen as too loud, too much, and too uncontrollable savagery. And it's not a coincidence that when you see, like, for example, we were colonized by the British, this was never really a big part of their culture. So for them, they saw these things as intimidating, as not aligned with what they want, especially if they were missionaries, whether they were from the Americas or from Europe. They saw these things as intimidating to the kind of Africans we have to be to be civilized and to be more like them and less like what we were. There was also this amazing um, African pastor who I think he has like a really great way of balancing those two things out, especially for Africans who want to be and continue to be religious, but they want a more decolonial approach to it. He talks a lot about how in so many ways us being Christians, um, I think he was an Ad Adventist himself. He is an Adventist, but he takes a very African approach to it. And one of the criticism he had of religion was that it kind of asked Africans to not be Africans in order to be religious, right? That you couldn't be both. You couldn't be a proud, culturally grounded African who appreciated your African heritage and history and teachings and approaches, and then also be a Christian. There was a sense of a purification that meant that you had to turn away on your Africanness, which were closer to the devil, <laughs> and then take on the most civilized way of existing, which was closer to whiteness and godliness, right? When it comes to family and culture, I think that has been something that I've also been exploring in that sense, but also knowing that my family is very religious, especially the family side I'm closest to, which is my mother's side. And I think also being a non-believer in my family hasn't really brought on too much backlash. I think it's not something that we talk about. It's not something that is promoted or I would say my mom is particularly proud of. <laughs> So I don't know how many people um, in my own uh, family know that I'm not religious. If there is prayer, if there is singing, I might engage to a certain degree. I'm not allergic or against religion or the practice of religion in my family or in my friends um, who are religious. I think I've developed a healthy way of coexisting with that and it also is very aligned with what I'll share later on, like what I use as guidance for my life. And I think I've shared that also before. Some of you have seen my videos. I think it's only annoying when sometimes I can sense when people find out I'm not religious, they want to reconvert me. And I find that sometimes very patronizing because it's the assumption that I just willy nilly and I don't do a lot of things big things willy nilly like I put a lot of effort in understanding and researching and before I make a decision a big one you can bet your ass on that I have turned a lot of corners but there is this way of um, approaching somebody who might choose not to be religious that it's just because you didn't understand the bible well enough um, and you because if you understand the bible you would be religious like that kind of is 
which I understand because I think I'm lucky that I've been religious long enough to understand the way of thinking like that. Because you have to, you are committed to your religion and not only committed to it, you see it's the truth, the all knowing truth. I think also sometimes it's like when sometimes people find out I'm vegan and then they go on these monologues, these long monologues about why they wouldn't be or why it's not good or what have you. But I think over the years I've learned to just let them have that space because I know it's not about me most of the time. It's more them affirming. I think they've met meeting someone who is not what you are so strongly or maybe sometimes something that you didn't even put a lot of effort to think why you do it you just do it because it's the norm then in that moment you have to kind of find a way to justify for yourself like reaffirm yourself why you choose this specific way of living or eating or believing so i've come to a place where i just let people speak and i'm like okay i'm just a mirror (laughs) and somebody's just speaking and affirming themselves through me through a dialogue they're having with me so that is interesting when it comes to family dynamics but as far as my immediate family there has been no issue and I've been very fortunate. I know friends who are who stopped believing from other faiths who cannot come out to their family because they know that they could um, lose the love and community they have within their family if they were to find out that they're not religious anymore. So I'm very fortunate in that regard that that is not something that I've had to face. But I'm also lucky that my family, my everyday family is very small because we live in a foreign country. Who knows how that would be if I grew up in my home country, if I was around my aunties and uncles and cousins and everybody, how that would be. But I'm also sure I'm not a unicorn in my family, neither as a queer person or as a heathen. I know there's a lot of maybe some of us in hiding. (laughs) Um, And sometimes you have to be that way if you're not in a safe environment to survive. So I really don't take that for granted. I think also being non-religious has not deterred me from other people who are religious, as long as they're not forceful about their religious beliefs, (laughs) obviously. I think I would have a hard time dating someone who was religious and very committed to religion because the kind of person I am and the way I see the world and the way I move around the world, I think we would maybe, unless the person was very open-minded, like my religion is for me and not the way that I think everybody should see the world, then maybe it could be possible because even I, I was raised by a mom who was a Christian and a dad who was Muslim. So mm, maybe not the best example, but they didn't clash because of different religions. They clash because... One of them was not mentally sane. <laughs> That's the big, that is like the <laughs> the biggest reason. I don't think they had time to clash because of religion because there were so many other things <laughs> that, were not a, that were not a match, right? Um, but I, I don't think that when I'm dating, if somebody is very Christian, like the kind of person who would put God in their bio or maybe verses in their bio, I must admit that I'm, I'm like, okay, that person and their religiousness is very important. There's a lot of things I do, or there's a lot of ways I am (laughs) as a godless African that they might maybe not agree with or be judgmental towards. Um, And that's me being judgmental towards them (laughs) based on what they believe in. But in everyday life, like in friends and what have you, I really do not care. Like, I feel like it's also nice to have people of different faiths, of different, because it gives you a different perspective through the life. I'm not somebody who particularly wants to be surrounded with people who think exactly like me. Um, But I do need to be surrounded by people who are very live and let live in the sense that this is my opinion, but you also get to have yours. I don't think I'm into people that are very pushy about their perspectives or their points of all their lifestyles. And I also try my best to not be like that. It's more like this is where I am, this is what I've experienced, and this is what I believe in. I think another thing that I've been learning to be better at is previously, I think I was very shy from speaking or criticizing religion because usually it's just this big thing that you don't do you don't criticize the religions of africans because it's a huge part of many african people's lives and so i think previously i've kind of like tiptoed around it because it's a very sensitive topic but i think in recent years 
especially seeing so much hypocritical reasons to why people stand fast in their faith while criticizing or promoting harm towards other people. I think I've become more like, okay, it's important for us to also speak about religion and criticize religion from an African perspective because the people who are religious use it often as the reason for bigotry, for hate, for um, pushing narratives that are harmful to other people just because it's not aligned with their book and it's not aligned with their faith, which I think is always very dangerous. I think that is something that over the years I've, I've learned to not be so shy about speaking up against religion, even though on a bigger scale, I'm not somebody, I know that in the atheist spaces, there's some people who would go as far as saying that we should eradicate religion. I don't believe in that. I think doing anything like that, that forces people out of something that they're still very, um, not only identified with, but dependent on, it can have worse consequences than letting people find their own way or maybe adopt their religiosity in a different way, like I feel my family has done. It's not as strict and it's not as um, dogmatic. It's also very allowing for people to have different experiences. And my mom is a big example of that as somebody who is religious, but who has been able to allow me to be everything that is not that. So I think that speaking about it was in the beginning a bit of a sensitive thing, but especially with people I think who might come from the space of wanting to reconvert you because they think that, oh no, you are lost and you have to come back to God. There I might be more, depending on how I feel, I might just let them have their moment. Or I might be like, well, let me turn it to you. If you grew up somewhere else, if you were born to a Hindu family, you would have probably belonged to Hinduism. So, and if you grew up somewhere where Buddhism was practiced, you'd have belonged to that. So there's a reason that you think that this is the only way. And it's fair to question that and not see it as just, that's what we do, you know? I, as an African, I want and I hope that we can live in a world um, or in Africa, a future where more people are okay with questioning everything, not just the things that feel comfortable to be questioned. I feel like being religious and dedicating your life to something and having to follow that teaching until you die, it's important that you understand why and it makes sense and there is answers. And when there's no answers, it makes it a bit harder for someone like me, who is very curious and wants to know things like from a foundation perspective and not just that's just the way it is. I think. Morality and ethics. When I was younger, I thought I was like an evil child. And looking back as an adult, I can't find a specific reason why I thought I was an evil child. But I remember always being so grateful for having Jesus in my life. I always connected more to Jesus than God. I always prayed to Jesus um, because I just found him to be kinder and sweeter. But I always was grateful for having Jesus in my life because I thought without him, I would just be running amok and doing evil stuff, you know. And I really believed that the only thing that kept me good and decent was because I believed in, in Jesus. I think when I left religion, then, of course, I wondered, am I going to be evil now? And also, what does evil even mean without the context of the Bible, right? All the things I was taught growing up. And what does good and bad mean if I'm not basing it on my religious upbringing? And what would motivate a person to be good if there was no heaven as a reward and if there was no hell as punishment? And over the past decade, I've had to define that for myself. I've even like made... A video here, I think, also questioning good and bad and what it means to be a good person. And it turns out that, of course, without God or being godless, you would have to rely on other things. There is like social norms, there is laws of the land, but there's also good old consciousness, right? You're conscious. But what has really influenced also the way I see the world now is maybe also already there from when I was younger as well, because I used to love Animal Planet and the nature TV. I felt like I could spend hours watching that. I wanted to learn about all these ways that animals coexist, 
the ways that they hunt, the way just I found it so interesting and I naturally really connected to it. And I think in a way that has also progressed to me having a more naturalistic approach um, mixed with forms of consequentialism when it comes to my ethics or morals. I think a lot of it is quite based in the fact that what makes the most sense and what causes the least amount of harm, but also the understanding that every action has an equal reaction and what we do to others, we do to ourselves and trying to have that holistic approach, but that is very based in not good and bad, but just actions and consequences. And I think I learned a lot about that from nature specifically because nature doesn't have a sense of bad and good. We don't say the lion murdered the zebra, <laughs> the lion hunted the zebra and ate the zebra. We kind of leave morality out of it and it's just nature acting. There's this, the animal needs to eat, it's a prey, it's a predator, but we don't necessarily see that as good and bad. And I've been able to take on those understandings in my human world as well, even the idea of prey and predator, there are people that are really predatorial by nature and there are people that make great prey. And understanding these dynamics is also good, not in the way of judging good and bad, but understanding how you best take care of yourself in this human jungle that we think is so much more removed from the natural world, right? And I always wanted to lean towards principles or guidings that just were consistent and made sense. And my biggest teacher in that has been, of course, other people and interactions, but I always say this is nature, paying attention to nature. Sometimes when I find what we humans say and do confusing, I refer back to nature and like what would make sense in a natural setting. And that for the most part can also be quite guiding. It's not that I take it all, <laughs> as a purest form, but I think there's a more stability and there's more consistency because nature hasn't been able to be manipulated in the same way as our own human nature has been through years of civilization, imperialism, capitalism, um, religiosity. There's so many things we've done that we can't connect to our own human nature, so to say. Reverting back to something that is more cons consistent and almost neutral. There is no good or bad. There's no political agenda. There's no power struggle. It's just the balancing of an ecosystem. I feel like sometimes I can relate more to that when it comes to moral and ethical guidance. And even when I think about things like being a vegan or or even the way I eat, I also relate that in that regard as well, that in nature, you have like herbivores and you have omnivores and you have carnivores and at the same time none of them is good or bad it's just what their natural setting is set up for and I also believe the same approach for my veganism I don't necessarily think that it's for everybody I think there are people in their certain biologies that are created to thrive more on meat and to thrive more maybe even an omnivore diet. And then there's certain biologies that will do quite well um, on a herbivore diet. And I think it's also related to where our genetics um, develop. Like if you come more from the north, if you become more even further up the Inuits, right? Like what was available to your people? Whereas I come from a very tropical space and we had more lush, we had more food available, biodiverse foods available to us for longer periods of the years and especially vegetables and fruits. So that can also influence how I today then can maybe thrive better on a diet that is less meat oriented because my DNA. So I might be making in human world a moral and principle um, decision, but I can also connect to it from a biological nature uh, perspective. Just because I have access to all this meat and all of these forms of feeding myself, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for me or healthy for me. And that is something that I can use as a guide. But everything I, I choose for myself, I also understand it in a holistic context that doesn't need to be copy pasted for everybody else because they live in their own unique holistic context. So, right? When it comes to things that I, I believe in and things I take on, 
It can be even like simple phrases such as "play stupid games," "win stupid prizes." I like that because it shows that you have to be aware of what you are doing and why you're doing it and what you think you're gonna get out of it. Does that actually make sense to you? Do you really want to be a part of this game or this setting or this way of living? And is it something you've decided, or is something you think there is no choice in being a part of? I think we always have a form of choice, even in the most restrictive of situations. If the only thing you have is your mindset and your way of seeing the world, even that is a liberty that a lot of us don't utilize. You get to opt in and out of power dynamics, and you get to opt in and out of ways of thinking about the world, and you have to be actively engaged in that. So I like to reflect on things and the way they are, ask questions, <laughs> be curious, and then I make the choice, or I take the path that makes the most sense to me after evaluating those things. That's how I use and interact. Um, with the things that influence my ethics or morality, but none of it is fixed from a place of good and bad per se. It's more like I say, like, what does this do? What is the ripple effect of this choice? The next one I also really like, and I repeat a lot, is live and let live. I think it's a, a way of living that allows others to choose and allows you to also choose without interfering in other people's lives. It gives a sense of tolerance, acceptance, and diversity, and I think we would have saved us from a lot of pain as a human race if we had lived and let live more. When you think about all the things we are trying to reverse currently, they can all kind of be traced back to the fact that we were, or certain people <laughs> in our humanity have been very um, bad at letting other people be. We see it even today, like the things that we promote, the things that we want to globalize and put everywhere. There is this sense that just because something has worked somewhere and it's great somewhere, that everybody now should be um, expected to take on those norms, those traditions and those cultures. And I don't necessarily agree with that. It's something that I often also try to have a balance with, like in my last video when I was talking about the gay rights in my home country, the lack of gay rights, the gay persecutions, um, persecutions in my home country of Uganda. There's also that understanding that this Western pressure to make Ugandans do and have certain laws, I don't agree with that, even though in this element, it's in my favor, so to say, right? But I hate whenever some even something is pushed on people from other people's perspective and agenda. And that goes for everything, for people's religions, for the people's sexualities, for people's way of seeing the world. So live and let live for me is about tolerating that fact and understanding that you didn't create me, I didn't create you. You have no actual authority over me and I have no actual authority over you. The only authority that we have legitimized, legitimized is through violence and threats. Without that, if nobody could threaten anybody, everything would be on a basis of, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me too. It would be volunteerism. It would be people choosing because it made sense to them. But this concept of violence that we have infused in choices makes it so that a lot of people, again, are, we, are, we feel herded towards certain choices or way of living because otherwise there is that threat. And that dy dynamic is also quite reflected in religious ways of being, like uh, the punishment and the rewards and who gets to decide who are the gods that decide the punishments and the rewards if you comply or do not comply. And we have that as well in our cultures, we have them in our government, and this idea that there is this all-knowing truth, what is best for everybody. And if you don't agree, then you get to find out, you get the punishment of that. But I feel like from an individual perspective, that is something that I I try to um, refrain from and live from a very live and let live perspective and trying to understand different perspectives. And as long as your perspective is for you and doesn't harm me. And I know like it can maybe even come up as naive because obviously there's always somebody who's going to say, what if your live and let lives about harming people? Well, actually you can't do that because live and live would also mean that you can't harm other people. I feel like that 
is also quite aligned with my deep colonial practices and my womanist approaches and, and my desire to elevate the the harm we've caused to our ecosystems as well, like nature. Because that's also because we've denied diversity, we've denied different ways of living, we've de denied different lifestyles and different perspectives. And now we are all gathering in these fancy rooms with our fancy suits, talking about how do we save the planet, but nobody's talking about how did we get here so we can stop doing that. I think it's, um, it's very harmful, like this confirming conforming of people, of cultures, of nature. Even when you talk about from a biodiversity um, perspective, like monocultures and um, monocrops, how dangerous they are for the environment. And it's the same thing we can learn for ourselves that when we have cultures or when we have um, societies that want everybody to be the same, it's actually dangerous for that society and it creates more harm than a society that is more open to diversity and different lifestyles and different perspective that creates more harm when more inventions, more creativity, and thrives more. An ecosystem survives because of diversity. It's the same even within your own body. You can only be healthy if you have a diverse kind of interconnectedness play of even the good and bad bacteria. It's what makes you stronger. It's what makes you immune, able to fight out serious viruses and what have you. We see it in so many ways shown as a fact in nature. And for a long time, indigenous people understood this, but this monocultured way of seeing the world that came with imperialism and colonialism trampled on that. So I feel like for me also, when it comes to ethics and morality, and removing God from that, removing religion that had kind of this one way of seeing the things, it helps me diversify, even for myself, different people's perspectives and views and wisdom. And I can take from all of that and enrich the way I choose to live and enrich the way I see the world, the way I see a problem, the way I find solutions. I think it has made me a much more creative person, a much more expansive person, a much more um, encompassing and accommodating person because I'm not seeing the world from one specific um, perspective or one specific teaching, so to say. The next phrase that also helps guide my ethics and morality is no masters, no slaves. This is one that I learned more about in my exploration of anarchism. Um, I always say that I lean a bit, I'm like a lazy anarchist, but I see it as the one that really resonates with the more things I find. But I also think it's something that society will slowly have to work towards. We are not there yet, but I like that all these different things are present <laughs> because there is reference points to it. And just like now we are only paying attention to living more sustainable, like questioning the way we grow food. Whereas people have been shouting about that for years, you know, about the dangers of monocrops uh, and the dangers of meat farms and what they're doing to the environment. And also our health. people have been shouting about that for decades. But sometimes you just have to keep on mentioning things and shouting things. And then eventually they pick up steam. And I kind of think that live and let live or the idea of no masters and no slaves, aka something that is quite aligned with anarchist thought, I feel like those kinds of things will also build up steam as more and people get more and more frustrated with the fact that it doesn't matter which government we put in place. It doesn't matter if we always revert back to people having power over other people, there's room for corruption because there's certain people that love to have power over other people. And these people are not naturally always more moral, more loving, more understanding, or even the wisest. They just love having power over other people. And when we give them platforms to do that, we also make it easier for them to, yeah, make our lives into living hells. And people keep feeling that, oh, we need new parties, we need better politicians, we need, and I think eventually you, if you want to get to the root of it, you get to the space where you question, why do we have the need to be ruled over, right? And I think like that's a bit of a more, <laughs> we're not there yet. We are definitely not there yet, but there's still people who have come to that realization who are and I lean also a bit more to that realization because I don't like fixing symptoms. I like to get to the root of things. 
usually that's how I handle problem solving. Like what is continuing this? Not just what is this immediate situation, but what is continuing that we keep having the same issues over and over again. And for me, it's the inability for people to take self-ownership and be masters of their own ships, you know, like the need for other people to rule over you and tell you what to do. And I'm not saying that this is never needed in any form, I'm not in the space of there is no place where somebody can have authority over another, because sometimes people have authority with skill, you know, like I cannot be a surgeon. There's certain things I, do, I don't trust me with your taxes. There's certain things I don't have skills to have authority. That's a different kind of authority. It's authority of expertise. But then there's the authority that just comes from because I say so. And if you don't do as I say, you got violence. Not because I know more, not because I care more, not because um, I have a better, a bigger conscience than you, but just because I say so. That is not a legitimate enough reason for people to justify ruling over other people. But yeah, I think like that's something that kind of is part of our human evolution and we would maybe one day get there. Maybe definitely not in my lifetime, but while I'm still here, it's nice to know that there are a lot of people who have explored that area. Like why do we keep experiencing the same forms of sufferings and injustices? It's almost like it's made to be like that and not so much because we haven't voted for the right politicians yet. Um, okay, the next one is a good one and it's also a great golden rule, like just basically treat others as you'd want them to treat yourself. It's also something that is reflected back in the Bible. Like I said, also, even though I'm a godless African, I also think that there's a lot of wisdom in a lot of teachings, um, including the Bible. And I don't necessarily think you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but it's more about choosing things that maybe make sense um, and taking it like any other wise and old book that I might read. I'm not going to base my whole life by dogma to it through dogma to it but i'm also not arrogant enough to say it has nothing to teach at all because that would also not be true so yeah treating others as you'd want them to treat i think it's also a great thing i use as guide there's nothing i do or take on that is very limiting or dogmatic in any way i think i just try to be the kind of person that if i look in the mirror at the end of the day i can be proud of who i am and i can like who i am and the decisions i make i can stand by them and when i don't i appreciate to have a conscience of guilt or shame that can guide me to change that and do better and be better um, but also I love the fact that I'm not doing any of the things I do for a reward. Like I don't believe I'll go to heaven or a better spiritual realm because of the things I do or that I'll be punished per se. I think I just believe that it's the right thing to do. It feels like intri intrinsically and emotionally like and logically to me is the right thing to do to cause as little harm as you can towards other people, towards the environment, towards the other beings that we share this earth with. So I feel like that's the best way I can summarize my morality and ethics and what helps guide them. There's certain things I've grown a bigger conscience for because I also feel more responsible and like I have to do something about it and not just pray about it. But I think I am more action focused as a non-believer than maybe I was as a religious person. I'm not saying that that's always the case for all religious people. Some of the amazing leaders and revolutionaries who also wanted social justice and changes were also religious. So I wouldn't necessarily say that the two can't go hand in hand, but I think personally on an individual experience, it feels like it's been easier to do that um, now that I'm not religious, because I'm like, I have to get in the fight as well and add to um, do what I can to make the world a little bit better if this is my forever home and the forever home of future generations, right? There's a sense of responsibility. And then like, obviously there's the last one that I say also even in my videos, which is basically to be kind, but also take no shit. I think that is very 
self-explanatory. Um, as a very soft person, as somebody who is a lover, not a fighter, it's very important for me to always choose kindness. And I always try to meet most people from the space of kindness and respect. Now, if you act differently or if you are in a different time zone than that approach, then I'm also not afraid to stand up for myself. I come from a very proud and long line of female wordsmiths and our ability to speak life and death is very, 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 very empowering and important. And I'm not afraid to hand over the curse of silly, for example, in the color purple. And I think that's also coming from a place of knowing that you can defend yourself. You have the right to defend yourself and you have the right to let people know when they've messed up and um, not be so strained by this idea of being nice and accommodating and allowing that I think sometimes when we saw what it meant to be a great Christian, it could also make you into somebody who was also easier to abuse. And I think growing up and working on my own experiences with trauma and abuse, that has been something that I've had to learn how to take care of myself, set boundaries um, and defend myself and how to remove myself from harm's way. And how many chances are too many chances? How much forgiveness is good and how much forgiveness is delusion? So all of those things I've had to also explore within the last decade and choose a more holistic way of approaching conflict. I think I'm less afraid of conflicts as well because I have made an effort to understand not only myself the best I can, but I'm also very interested in other people and just human psychology. And I think it's also helped to make me take things less personal because I know most of the time, even when people are trying to harm you or hurt you, it doesn't have a lot to do with you. To take you from that space doesn't mean that you allow it to continue, but it makes you also feel more confident in setting your boundaries because it's more, hey, I need you to go and deal with your inner world so that we can actually have a way of coexisting and communicating that is not harming, harmful to one another. I feel like that's something that I... I've become more confident in, especially from just the power of the tongue and being able to defend myself with the tools that I have. When it comes to meaning and purpose, I think this one is quite important because when I was religious, of course, I had the full story of why I was here, how I got here, what I'm doing here and what will happen when I die. Without a God, Everything, like I said, it's an open field, it's a blank canvas, like why are you here? What are you doing here? And what's the purpose of being here? As a non-believer, that a lot of the things that anchor my reason to be or my purpose in life can be summarized by, I want to live a life worth living. And that kind of guides a lot of the other things. and invites me to have meaning in the way that I do and the way I approach life. And I think it also like takes away from the idea of trying to find purpose and meaning, but more kind of trying to engage with life from a purposeful space, like do things intentionally, be intentionally here. Don't be somebody who got dropped off on this planet and waiting to return somewhere, you know? Growing up as a religious person, this earth is like a waiting room for something better. So being able to be here intentionally has for me made it so that I am fully engaged with being here. There is no somewhere else for me, right? Even though I do believe, like I say, that I believe that there's something bigger. And I think whatever it is, it's already here. I don't need a missionary. I don't need a God. I don't need a priest. I don't need anybody to connect me to that. It's just here. Like I breathe, like I eat, <laughs> like I speak, you know, there's things that are just naturally part of you. And I think that holy and divine presence is already just a part of me and of us, right? For my my worldview, my spiritual worldview, that's what echoes to be truth. Um, and so 
meaning for me is engaging fully with that. I really love this quote by Maya Angelou and I've also shared it on my website. Like for me, it's what can summarize almost uh, an approach to life that is all encompassing and holistically beautiful. And in it, she just says that my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor and some style. I love all of that because that when I read that, I was like, that's totally me. That's what I want. That's that's why I love my Angela so much. I feel like we could come from the same souls or the same soul village, wherever our souls come from, because I totally re uh, connect with that. I want to live a holistically beautiful life. I don't want to just be here to survive. I have no intention of just copy pasting my way to my grave. I want to engage with my choices, my paths, the way I live, the way I love, the way I dress, the way I show up. I want it to be, yes, that makes sense. Yes, I love that. Yes, I want that. Yes, more of that. Not just, that's just what we do and then I'm gonna do this because that's what we do and then, no. And I think doing life like that, it gives me also more confidence and more self awareness and self-understanding because I know I'm fully engaged with my choices, my decisions, my paths, um, the people I have in my life, the way I create community around me. I'm very deliberate about how I am here. And then beyond that, I also don't think that it's supposed to be this grandness, you know, this I'm here like the bees, like the trees, like the worms, like the eagles, like the cows, like everything else that is here. I'm here and God damn it, it's amazing that I'm here for now, for however long I'll be here. And I think that's also like the things that echo in the things I create or why I create. Like there's this feeling of knowing that this is not going to be forever. Maybe my soul is forever. And I do believe that because I think there is, when I see again nature, my biggest teacher, everything has this the cycle of recycling. So I would not be surprised if that was also echoed in our souls. Perhaps I'll never return as me, may, right? Like this is a once in a lifetime experience. But I am aware that maybe my soul might have been here in different ways and could come back in a different way. But regardless, now it's here is me. And this is something that I have to see as a present, as a, a special occasion, as good enough of a reason to live as vividly as I possibly can and intentionally and purposefully and create a meaning for my life, not find it, not be told what it is, but a meaning for my life that I'm connected to, right? And I feel like that is the best way that I've been able to redefine my idea of purpose and meaning and not having to wait for a heaven or a hell and recognizing all the ways that I can engage with the heavens here and, and the ways that I can alleviate some of the hells that I felt I've gone through, other people have gone through, that by itself is good enough for a reason to keep being here, keep breathing and keep continuing on. So that has also been a favorite thing of mine to redefine. And this planet is amazing. If you forget everything about what people do to each other, because a lot of the issues and things that make this unbearable is other people. <laughs> it's not the earth itself. It's other people. If you take that away, this earth is amazing. It's beautiful. I love to travel and I hope to continue to see as much of this beautiful earth before I sarinara out of here. Um, and what has been evident and sure wherever I've gone, this place is chef's kisses. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful here. I love it here. You know, I love it here. And I want to see and experience as much of it as I possibly can. Even my people who come from East Africa that is seen and known as maybe the original Garden of Eden, we have come from a, such a beautiful, rich land, right? An area of the world. And the only reason it's held to be there is because of the other people there. <laughs> it's not because of the place itself, it's other people. We are each other's hells, right? But we can also be each other's heaven. 
and we felt that too in different ways. There's so much beauty even in human connection, but I think we're just so removed and disconnected to our power that we don't recognize that we have that power to decide if this life is gonna be hell or heaven because somebody has convinced us that those things are beyond our control. They're up there or below there, but we get to decide every day if we're existing from a place of hell or from a place of heaven, if we're contributing to heaven on earth, if we're contributing to hell on earth. We are constantly co-creating our experiences here, even though a lot of us, I think, do it mindlessly. So to be engaged with life and be present and be intentional and be accountable and responsible, I think it's the best chance I have at living an aesthetic life, a beautiful life. And a beautiful life is not a perfect life, but it's a life that has meaning to me because it's fully intentionally chosen as best as I can. Advocacy and activism. I think this one is also something I touched upon in my, when I was speaking about um, ethics and morality. I think because before I always learned, again, this is a waiting room for us to be tested. Are we going to be good or bad? And then we're going to go to heaven and everything's going to be perfect. <laughs> um, and this earth is going to be destroyed. There's no real reason to over-engage. It's just like keep your, your head in the game, you know? where you're going. Removing that, <laughs> you kind of then are like, oh, okay, I guess we have to do something about everything here, <laughs> you know, because there's no savior coming to take you out of this situation. And I think in an interesting way, even from a political space, even as Africans on the continent, I think this also influences the way we approach change in our communities, in our cultures, in our countries. There is this need to wait for a certain savior, you know, whether it's in uh, foreigners or um, foreign investment or foreign aid or uh, a president promising something. This idea that somebody's going to make come and give us a path and save us from our, our disasters and our pain, it kind of teaches you a certain kind of helplessness. Um, now I'm not very into the whole, like, pull yourself up from the bootstrap. It's only you. But I am also saying that sometimes we have more power than we believe we have, or we are taught to believe we have, or even playing with the idea of what if there's nobody coming to save us, right? Like this is it. There's no new planet. There's no planet B, you know, you're not going to get a new, it's not like trash this one because then you're going to get a nice planet, a real actual planet that it's going to be like paved with gold and milk and honey. Um, and I think it's going to be like ethical gold and maybe there'll be like vegan options for <laughs> vegans. I don't know if there'll be cows <laughs> that are being milked in heaven. I never even thought about that, but. What I'm trying to say is, which actually is the kind of person I am, I'm like, mm. Now that I think about what we were supposed to do in heaven, even the idea of having to, because I remember asking my mom, what would we do in heaven? Like, first of all, we'll forget our lives here because we are all sin and pain is going to be eradicated. So you shouldn't remember all the things you did, good or bad, even experience, because maybe that could entice more sin and then we would have to start over. We don't want that. Um, but the whole purpose was we, we would go there, we would celebrate with the dead people that went before us some of them maybe will go to hell and then we would be our memories will be erased so you won't even remember that you made it right and then we would spend our entire life adoring and praising god at least from my religion that was the heaven package we were offered and when i think about it now i'm like that's not it for me like and that maybe only sounds amazing if it's somebody tells you either you get this package or you burn in hell forever then you're like oh okay give me that package <laughs> you know but I remember even as a religious person I was like why is there no option c I don't want to go to heaven because I I hate singing over and over again which is true but the idea of just being there to adore and sing praise to a being it makes no sense to the kind of person I am <laughs> And then the idea of burning in hell forever, that's also very petty, you know? Um, why? Why can't you just say, boof, you chose not to be here, so you're gone. Why do you need to suffer? Like, what, will that suffering change anything? 
do you have to burn for that long in order to make sure that the evilness never comes back? Anyway, so I'm not trying to evoke like a theological discussion here. I'm just trying to say that. So I feel like leaving religion and especially when it comes to certain things that maybe my religion made more acceptable. For example, in the way we treat animals, like animals were often given as offerings for sins. Humans were created to rule over animals, not like in a lot of indigenous way of seeing the world where we are in a circle together, not that man is above all animals and the earth and gets to do as they please, but that we all exist in an ecosystem where we need to respect each other. I feel like leaving religion made that more clear for me. And then when it comes to things like womanism and even fe feminism, womanism, I think also growing up in a religion that made women as an afterthought, um, not because they are worthy of existing by themselves, but it was an afterthought because Adam might be bored <laughs> and he needed a help. Um, and then God was like, oh, I know, I'll create you a helpmate. And also even the way that they speak about women in the Bible, which can be very, you know, like you are a second class thing in the religion itself and a lot of Abrahamic faith, faiths. So that also is something that I could then not accept so easily as a godless African because I'm like, you have no right to rule over someone else. And we talk about virgin births and that women came from men. But in my life of existence, men have always come from women. Just this whole religion I felt was very convenient for men. <laughs> Too convenient, you know, for men. And as somebody who is a womanist, I think it also, it makes it um, more apparent. Like when we think about patriarchy and the disaster that patriarchal perspectives have caused and had on the world and toxic masculinity, which is not just every day, maybe somebody being catcalling you or have you, but toxic masculinity is also how we've designed the world in some way where we've over prioritize one gender and a specific way of that gender existing at the expense of everybody else. And I think that is also something that was quite um, supported by religion. We also know with capitalism, with colonialism, imperialism, a lot of it also had backing by the church, by, yeah, by religious leaders that this was the right thing to do, even in the guise of promoting God's message. So I feel like it made it easier for me to disconnect to those things and also see how problematic they are as somebody who's not blinded by that justification through religion. Because even in religion, when we talk about slavery, promoting this hierarchical way of existing where some people have power over others and have the right to rule over other people and treat them poorly, more or less. Because there's no condition or situation in where you are a respected slave. That whole idea means that you humanity is stripped from you and you are of service to someone else. Like I know people like to to go into the depth of, oh, it's the root of the word, like the Slavics and, you know, your servant, da, da, da. but when we know what a slave is, we, when we understand it, I don't believe ethically, like just as a mere sinful human, like in a religious sense, that it makes any sense to rule over someone and remove their autonomy over their life in servitude towards you. And so that would also make a lot of space for other forms of oppression because a lot of Abrahamic faiths have kind of a, a condoning of that, do not necessarily condemn that outrightly. They might have a few things here and there, say, oh, you should treat them with respect, you should be loving towards them, you should... But still, it's the mere fact that it's the same thing when people say some of some slave owners back in the day were really good to their slaves. And even when slaves were freed, they wanted to stay with their slave owners. It doesn't make the concept of slavery right, you know, because you wouldn't want if you wouldn't want to be something that by itself makes it unjustifiable to force someone else to be it. Right. At least I feel like I know that's very simplistic, but. I think it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Removing that religious perspective of we're going to be saved by someone, removing that religious perspective of even the idea of women being subordinate to men, 
which is like all the hype in that, like I've talked about before, in the manosphere, like submissive women, this whole idea like that women are here to tend to the egos of men, you know, it's, it's very toxic and it makes space for a lot of abusive dynamics that women face throughout the world and especially in very religious countries, right? So I feel like releasing that kind of also made me see those dynamics for what they were and also understand the structure in which they were justified and uh, and to this day are upheld even though people might say oh but our government is secular yeah but still the way it's built the fact that the majority of the people in there are men <laughs> kind of influences what kind of laws they're gonna approve or support and how those things affect other people also within that decade of godlessness, I've also managed to create several platforms, not only at Bantu May, I have, of course, May in Bloom, I've had exhibitions, I've had workshops, I've done so many things that I'm more engaged with creating a better world, at least in the intentions I have of creating community, of creating awareness and opening dialogue and spaces for healing and spaces for liberty that I think I wouldn't be as inspired to had I stayed religious and was just waiting for the world to end and then I can live my real life. I think being forced to engage in life in a different way has also meant that I have been feeling more responsible for the kind of world I want existing. And being responsible in that way also meant that I had to take more actions than maybe I would have as a person who saw the world from my religious upbringing. Yeah. When it comes to advocacy and activism, I think I've become more stronger in those spaces and more determined and more passionate about it because I know that, like I say, no person has the legitimate right over another person's life. It doesn't matter of gender, of sexual orientation, of spirituality. You did not create me, I did not create you, and therein lies our equality. You have no right over me and I have no right over you. But for a lot of people, that's very scary. Like the idea of that is very scary, intimidating, and they use a lot of things to justify hierarchical structures of oppression. Um, and I think it's going to take us a long time to recognize that that's not always necessary. We can coexist in harmony um, without having hierarchies of oppression. Earth, like when it comes to environmentalism and recognizing that because before religion, a lot of Africans worshipped nature and a lot of indigenous people worship nature. And I wouldn't even say just indigenous. I think all people of the earth before religion worship nature. There was also then a sense of respect for it. There was a sense of protecting it because we recognize that we needed it to survive. But then when you are told this right here, it's just the creation. What you need to focus on is the creator. That person is way beyond. You'll never meet that person until you die. So don't worry what we do here. Don't worry while we pollute the oceans. Don't worry while we um, strip <laughs> the minerals out of every corner of the world. Don't worry while we cut down the lungs of the earth to make place, space for capitalism and capitalistic ventures and the pursuit of we need to feed the human race, which is bullshit because we can be fed in so many most sustainable and healthy ways. Um, all of these things make it easier to do when you've told the indigenous people that their earth actually shouldn't be worshipped and it's not divine and it's not valuable. Um, and all it's valuable for it's what capitalism says is valuable. And then we wonder how we ended up here. That's why I always get annoyed in any environmentalistic talks and um, and negotiations when we don't talk about the impact of colonialism and the impact of imperialism and we just pretend that this thing just happened out of nowhere um because I, and also when we don't put it, people in power that have lived in harmony with the earth um, for centuries because if we care about the planet we would want to take on the wisdom of people who have lived in harmony with it the longest and the fact that most of these efforts are led predominantly by western people who have been the biggest causes of 
um, environmental destruction and even their lifestyles being pushed around the world have contributed to accelerating the negative impact we have on the earth. I think it's very sad and ironic that that's who we're supposed to be guided by into this new, more sustainable and green world. Being without religion has made me see those things a bit more clear. And I love when I connect to old African environmentalists and also how they also speak about that. One of the ways that Africans became alienated from their earth was through religion and alienated from their resources and from the wealth they already had was through religion. And I think with my own personal decolonization journey and that has also helped me see my activism and advocacy differently because it's not about taking on something that's un-African but actually reconnecting to the ways that our ancestors used to live in harmony with nature and respect with nature. Maybe not per se worship but from a place of worship in the sense that you recognize that you eat, you are sheltered, you exist because the earth provides and it deserves respect and be taken care of just like it takes care of us as well. The last thing I'd like to talk about is like spirituality and future outlook. I think the last decade has been very beautiful and it has been um, very inspiring as well. And I think the things I've done feel almost like it's only the beginning. I've just been tipping my toe into this new way of existing. When it comes to spirituality, I want to continue on my spiritual practice, even though I have no desire to belong to any religion per se. My spiritual practice and just me working towards self-alignment and growing wiser and growing more knowledgeable and growing more confident in the way I move around the world as a soul, as a being, I think what the next decades hold for me are even bigger and bolder things because I have spent the last decade like almost repairing and reshaping my foundation of life. And now that that kind of feels like it's a bit more solidified, it's more like, okay, what are we going to build on that? And that is very exciting to be in. But also it comes, of course, with age, but I've not just aged. I've intentionally each year, each month, <laughs> each day, I try to be mindfully here and learning and growing and unlearning. And I think I can't imagine what kind of person I'll be like in 10 years from now. But what I do know, if I continue the way I have been, in the last decade, I'm gonna like that person even more. And keeping my light on, that's also very important to me. Like, I think as we get older, you do notice that a lot of people are still alive, but there's a sense of them that is diminishing and dying with each year. And I think it's because we get crushed down so much and we, we conform and we contour ourselves and we let ourselves down we cut parts of ourselves off to survive and before we know it like we are foreign to ourselves even and i think there's something beautiful in 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 fighting against that and deciding that i want to be here fully from as full as i can of course things happen life happens but at every moment to be able to find back to your light, to who you are, to what brings you joy, what brings you meaning and what makes you feel like you're living purposefully. And I feel like I've become better and better at that. I think the next venture is also visiting and learning more about inner alchemy. It's a new place that I've been exploring. But also when it comes to spirituality, like I've been very open to different forms of um, spiritual teachings and maybe not so much the Abrahamic because I've already spent 23 years on those but like other forms that I wasn't as exposed to um, and being able to draw inspiration from different things but also knowing that whatever it is it's almost like I'm finding words for it outside but it's already within me um, one spiritual practice I discovered years ago that I really felt connected to was, for example, Taoism. And I was like, wow, that is really aligned with my concept of live and let live, with allowing, with flow, 
um, with being holistic, like that for me was like already aligned with what I am and what I believed in. And I found it reflected in a spirituality. I wasn't seeking something to change. I was just seeking something to connect to a bigger, broader teaching that kind of encompassed the worldview that I held dearly and the worldview that made the most sense to me. But I think moving forward, there's nothing again dogmatic about any of the approaches I take. There's nothing that is fixed and there's nothing I'm doing in the sense to mm, be seen a certain way, which is the most liberating part. I think I'm just happy to exist in a way that I really feel makes sense to me, that I really feel is as authentic to the kind of person I feel inside. I feel like that's what's going to continue to exist. And I think with the projects I have and the way I want my life to be and and the way that I am co-creating with life in a different way than I was before, I can see that there's things that are gaining momentum to a certain degree. And I can sense that things are only becoming brighter stronger and more grounded and I love that direction I really really love that direction I've also made more peace with my my shadow self and my light self like in the sense that I can live in harmony with all the parts of myself to the best of my ability and I feel more grounded I feel more clarity and I feel more presence and I feel more confidence in how I see the world what I think I want to do and how I want to do it and what I want to add to I feel like it's and I'm all for it but basically that's it this has been the longest video I've ever made I hope you've enjoyed it I hope it's kept you company I don't know what you've been doing what you've listened to me and thank you so much for making it this far if you have also ventured on a life without a god i really love to hear what your experiences have been so far what you've learned what has been the most shocking the most surprising whatever you want to share but i'm just happy to know that as a fellow african that there is more of an expansion of what it means to be an african And if that's all this journey does, I think I'm also very happy with that. Like, okay, you can be African and you can be without a a godless African, a spiritual African. You can be a queer African. (laughs) You can be a womanist African. You can be a vegan plant-based African. You can be an earth-loving African. There's so many ways to exist as an African and the options are endless and you get to decide and you have the right to decide for yourself and engage fully in the life and choices that govern your life otherwise thank you for watching and as i I always say we'll always say be kind but also take no shit and i'll see you in my next video bye guys